thank you very much, Alexander, for the introduction. By the way, stuttering is perfectly fine. I know people do uh, do talks and stutter, and it doesn't matter because, after all, it's the content we're after, right? So I'm try. I will try to talk about uh, something that's very dear to my heart, which is the relation of software architecture and lots of other things. I've listed organization, processes, humans, but I find that software architecture more and more plays a central role in uh, how digital stuff shapes our world. And I think it's really important that we are aware of this. Most of us in this room are from the tech side of things. And I think for some weird reason, we're suddenly responsible for things that we weren't really taught and uh, the consequences of which sometimes are not entirely clear to us. So I think it's worth spending some time with that. And I'll start with uh, architecture and organization. And as any decent talk with this type of topic needs to, I'll mention Conway's Law first. So my assumption is that most of you will, will already know this. Does anybody here know Conway's Law? Can you raise your hand? That's a significant number. Not everybody knows. So what this law uh, stated by, uh, by Mel Conway 50 or 45 years ago states is that there is a late relationship between an organization that creates software and the architecture that software has, the structure that software has. Organizations can only produce something that matches their communication paths. Think of it as something where uh, if you have two groups and they create a software system together, then it will necessarily have two pieces. There is no other way to get things to work. So you see structure is reflected from the real world in the actual software that you build. And there have been, once you've, once you've recognized that, you, you, once you've learned about this rule, about this law, you recognize it in lots of places. You see it everywhere. Every time you look at a, at a piece of software and wonder why is it shaped this way, this is very often the answer. And there are some interesting things. For example, one of the things that you can do with this law is you can use it and reverse it or apply it in reverse. And one of that is that you can uh, look at your architecture and think of which types of organizations does it support. For example, you might adopt a piece of standard software or some other thing provided by a vendor, and that might force you to create a certain organization that matches that particular structure. And of course, you can also create architecture with uh, the goal of having a particular organization in mind. This, of course, only works if that software architecture plays a very important role. Like if you're uh, building a startup that basically is defined by the piece of software you're developing, then the architectural decisions that you make shape the future of that company. You're shaping the, the fate of the human fate of people who have to work with that piece of software you create. So that's, that's uh, lots of laws. Uh, Mel Conway is still active on Twitter. You should follow him. He's a very smart person. He has a lot to say. Uh, although he's maybe like in five, that's not, that does not mean he doesn't have a lot to say anymore. So that's uh, my recommendation. I also want a law myself. So I keep trying this. I've had this slide in a number of talks the last few years. Somehow it doesn't catch on. Maybe this will be the conference where it finally works. But I think this is interesting from a data perspective as well, which is one of the reasons I'll bring it up here, which is that architecture also creates bottlenecks structurally during the development process, your deployment process, your runtime. And this effect affects how uh, you can proceed as an organization, what you can do and what you can't do, what is tough and hard to do and what it is. Uh, so um, the quality of your architecture is directly related to how well it manages to avoid bottlenecks in your structure. If this doesn't catch on, I have a second one. You can use that as well if you want to give me a rule that we have. So let me move on to my, my, uh, my key parts before I get to some patterns later on, which are these three things I've uh, picked these three because they're the most important to me when I talk about this particular talk. And let me start with the first one, which is modularization. So if you think of any kind of system that you build, let's just assume we're building some whatever e-commerce thing, some shop system, then, um, the first thing you, uh, you con you're you concerned with and the first thing you, you structure and, and think about is how this how it's embedded in the overall system landscape. What does, it what does it connect to? What kinds of interface does it have? That's like the context view of thing. And once you zoom into that particular thing you're building, you have to structure it internally. You have to figure out what is it builds up. What's its module structure or subsystem structure? What are the the 
business level decisions that you have to make to get this into something that's manageable. Because typically when you start building a larger system, you can't just start with everybody developing in their IDEs on day one. You actually have to structure things so that you can work in parallel and you have to focus on specific aspects. So this is some arbitrary structure that I, that I came up with for this sample. Um, and this process, this perspective, this view in architecture is mostly concerned with the domain. So if you're, if you're familiar with domain driven design and valid context, this is where you would apply that. Like you're thinking about how to carve up this larger thing into smaller pieces that are more manageable and that you can, can work. The second view that you have is the one that actually looks at how these things communicate, how they integrate, how they're managed. And I like to call that macro architecture because it's concerned with large scale decisions that are not related to the domain, because whether it's six or eight boxes and what exactly those boxes do, it doesn't matter that much for this type of decisions. It's still, it matters whether you have 500 or three, because that changes the macro architecture drastically. But, um, for the most part, you're making technical decisions here that are important across a number of different subsystems. And then you finally have whatever internal decisions you make for those things. This is something I'm going to get uh, into more detail about uh, later on, which is uh, the idea that for each of those things, you might be able to make a localized, a micro decision, which is why I like to call this micro architectures, right? We're talking about the individual decisions that we make for each of those pieces that don't necessarily affect the overall structure. So if you look at that, then, um, this structure here, this, these decisions that I've made here are decisions that need to be made pretty early on and that have very high importance. It's sort of critical that you get them right, which makes, which is why they're architectural decisions, right? Coming up with the right boundaries with the right system boundary is an architecture, architectural activity that you have to do first, right? And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a crucial thing. And it's often done by the wrong people because nobody with actual, with a technical background collaborates with the main expert. Sometimes it's just organizational structure that leads to these things. And you have to manage those dependencies across, across time. You'll have to figure out how to evolve that structure in the long run. And it'll happen to you whether you want it or not, because you cannot decide to not have an architecture. You can decide to not do architectural work. That's, that's okay. The, but then, you, then you'll end up with something that emerges, that happens to you. Lots of things happen to people. I think there are a ton of conscious decisions that we make. I picked one uh, out of that, which is the decision of how to modularize, how to do that. So if, if you're building a very small thing, then your modularization is maybe using a number of methods or procedures. If it grows, you might end up with modules. So the two axes here are the strength of decoupling needs and the number of developers that, uh, in, uh, involved in that, in that process, right? So if the number of developers at the size of the problem grows, you will use different strategies here. You might end up with components or even with microservices. I think there's something above that that's larger grained. I like to call those things systems. I think we build them all the time and we don't think about them enough, um, which is why, uh, why we've come up with this term self-contained systems. There's a website, you can read more about that. I don't have time to go into much detail about that, but the key idea here is that designing a system should be an architectural activity. Designing the system boundaries should be. And if you do that, if you apply that to a larger context, to a larger a project, a program setting, you will go from this layer systems architecture that everybody knows right where you have like, like these three things and that's your main structure. And then you have some modules within that thing. From this structure, you go to one where you make the modules a first class construct, you, you elevate them up one level and you end up with something that looks a bit more like this, like it's three systems and they may have the exact same internal layering architecture, but they also may have different ones because they have different needs. And again, you can see here that this idea of micro architecture decisions coming up again, right? For each of those things, something else might be the best possible choice. And this, uh, approach gives you that, gives you that comfort, that capability. So one other aspect I want to talk about in the context of organization is how these decisions that you've made shape your, your organizational structure within this particular project. So let's just assume I look at the team structure here. These are 
team green, team red, team yellow. And I've assigned them some of these systems or subcomponents. And you can see that I did that in a, a sort of kind of obvious way. Right? It's, it seems like, you know, that's how you would do it. You would not think of giving the green team half of the red box. That's not something you do. So actually the decisions that you made here on like a textual level shape how you can structure the project work, how you can structure your teams. So for example, you might find out that you, that these red boxes are too hard for one team to get right. So you split them into two boxes and give them to two teams. And the reason why you could do that was because you had this boundary here. If that boundary hadn't been there, you would have to refactor and restructure and figure out how to get that to two different teams. It is really hard for them to work on one tightly coupled thing, right? So the, the coupling or the decoupling shapes your ability to restructure your team organization. So I think we have something that you could call team architecture. Um, I actually think that's a really smart term. I wish I had thought of writing a book about it. Um, I did it, which is kind of sad, but totally okay because somebody else did. So um, the team topologies people uh, did a fantastic job of uh, looking into the role team organization plays in, uh, in, in building successful systems. So I definitely recommend that book. Um, uh, it talks about uh, the different kinds of work. It, 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 it lists some kind of team, team, uh, uh, team, or a team taxonomy, some kinds of uh, some, a list of team kinds that you might have and some collaboration models between them. Really good book, uh, highly recommend. I think if you want autonomous teams, and maybe you don't, but if you do want autonomous teams, that architecture is an essential ingredient. Um, you have to, uh, you have to somehow get those things in line. We'll get to them in a second again. Um, also, size is the big, your biggest enemy. You want to limit things to a manageable size. Um, the team topologist people talk about cognitive load. Maybe not the best metaphor, but there is a certain amount of work that a team can handle. Once you exceed that that possible load, things go really bad, right? And you can't grow a team arbitrarily. You can't have a team with 50 people. That's not a team. That's a disaster, right? You have to make multiple teams of that. Okay. I promised in my abstract that I'll give you some patterns and anti-patterns. I won't be able to get through all of them, but, but I will spend uh, some time uh, talking about uh, a few of those things. And the first one I have already addressed is this idea of having autonomous T's, or I'd like to call them autonomous cells, like, you know, terrorist cells, but for good things. They're like these, uh, these things that can operate as much as possible on their own. And the reason I'm a fan of this is because I believe uh, this makes almost everything better. If you have a team structure like this, with this cross-functional roles in there, like business people, developers, ops people, security people, data people, whatever, then um, you have this unit that can actually do a lot on its own. And I think that's a, that, is, uh, that is very important to uh, have, a, have some work satisfaction, which I think is very important to have to get people to work well. So you actually want to see the effects of what you do. You want to get actual feedback. You want to actually get, uh, get to see what you, what you built last week or yesterday, go into production somewhere. If it is a tiny little, little wheel and it is huge machine, you'll never see the effects of your work. In a structure like this, you hopefully will, because you're re responsible for uh, a certain cohesive set of function, functionality in an end to end manner. And, um, if you look at this structure, then, this is more an organizational view, it's more a people view, it's the team structure. And this is kind of the reverse of the slide that I showed you a few minutes ago. The system, system boundaries have to map the team's team boundaries. Because as soon as one system is owned by two or three teams, they have to synchronize. If they have to synchronize, that means they have to have meetings. And we all hate meetings, right? Nobody wants to do. Hmm. Is that actually true? I think we all hate meetings of a certain kind. We hate those things where it takes a week to set them up and then you're sitting there with 25 people or with lots of people that you don't know and have to figure out what to do with it. Unprodu we hate unproductive meetings. We hate bad meetings. We don't hate going to lunch with our colleagues. We don't have, 
we don't hate, hate our daily stand-up, I assume, unless you hate your colleagues, but hopefully you don't. So if you work for them, if you work in a nice team, if you work in a well-structured functioning team, those are not the meetings that are a problem. It's always this cross-team synchronization type of stuff that creates trouble. So to avoid that, yet you, you have to try to get up with this alignment of technical boundaries, system boundaries with your, uh, with your team structure. That is not always possible. It's very easy on a slide because I can just draw it this way. But in reality, some system might be there to can't change. Some structure might be outside of your influence sphere. Some organizational rule might prevent you from doing this, right? But as a goal, I think it's totally worthwhile. But the quick hint for each of the pattern slides, I have like a description like this, which I won't read to you because that will be totally boring. I'll just skip over them very quickly. But if you look at the slides later on, you can read um, the detailed description here. So that's my first pattern for this uh, for a successful thing. The second one is uh, self-service. This actually is German, it says Selbstbedienung, which means self-service. And it's the kind of sign that you have in Munich beer gardens if you ever happen to end up there which I highly recommend. So um, um, developer self-service means that somebody who has a need can actually get it, uh, get it solved without creating a ticket. So the anti-pattern matching is you have this fancy cloud environment, you have this great thing there. The only way to get it to do something for you is to create a ticket for some other human to actually do some automated stuff. That is not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is actual self-service. Like um, you have access yourself to some API or command line or possibly user interface that allows you to do whatever it is that you need to uh, to get your job done, like provision a new database or uh, create a function and change a firewall rule. I don't know why I picked that. Possibly because changing a firewall rule is the one thing that I know from past experience has the worst relation of actual efforts to time you have to wait for it to happen. Right, so um, try to open a port in a large company and you'll, you'll feel like you're in a Franz Kafka novel. So that's my first, uh, pa uh, second pattern. Um, the third one is related to this idea of keeping things small. Um, I used to call it evolutionary architecture. Now I like to call it architecture evolution because evolutionary architecture is also a book that I didn't write, which means something slightly different, but similar. The idea here is that once you have figured out how to structure things into smaller blocks, you end up with an architecture that can evolve, that can actually somehow be the same thing, yet not be the same thing. A bit like this old person and the baby. Um, I've analyzed the same person that I was when I was two years old. In a certain way, yes, I have the same identity. I'm, I'm the same legal human being, and I also sort of am the same being, right? On the other hand, I assume that not a single cell of my body is still there that was there 50 years ago. That's, that's not how humans work, right? You're, you get replaced, you get, you, you, your, your body renews itself to a certain degree unless it stops, just like software systems, right? So the, the idea here is that if you evolve a system, its architecture needs to uh, address that aspect. It's not about building the perfect architecture, but about building something that can grow that can change. So one of the uh, one of the things that we do a lot in our project is we help people modernize their applications, and that is sometimes extremely hard because those things are too big. If they're too big, then very often you can only modernize them with a huge effort because they have to do it with the whole thing. So, for example, one of the things that uh, that uh, people built um, 20 years ago. Uh, was very sophisticated persistency mechanisms um, that helped them to get access to their databases. Those um, like OR mappers that were homegrown and caching layers and transaction systems that were very fancy and did really cool stuff. Problem is nobody uses them anymore. Nobody wants to use them anymore. Nobody wants to find out how they work. And everybody tells me, well, just replace that with a piece of open source software, but you can't just replace it because it's spread over 15 million lines of code. And you'd have to find somebody who will give you the money to actually do that, which will yield no business benefit whatsoever. Just make your architecture better. So that's a tough sell. If instead, if instead of 15 million lines, a single system with 15 million lines, these were 30 systems, 
500,000 line each, and would be much easier to pick the most important two or three of them and modernize them. Right, so think of that. Think of the long-term evolution of part as it might be over a 5 or 10 or 15 year period and structure your system so that you can evolve it in that, in that regard. Okay. The next one is a bit related to um, how you govern this thing. So governance is a bad word if you're in, if you live like a, if you live in an agile world, right? How is it? That's like, that's, that's from the suit wearing insurance IT people. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is figuring out what, what sort of, um, level of agreement you need to have for everybody to be autonomous because autonomy requires structure, but if, if you have seven teams and every team does whatever it wants, you'll end up with complete chaos. That's not helpful. You want to give them some structure that allows them to do whatever they like, so, but still give you the opportunity to p turn the whole thing into a cohesive fold. And my favorite analogy for that is this regulated market here, which I think in every country has slightly different rules, but works sort of the same way. These individual merchants who sell their stuff have a lot of freedom about what they sell, how they sell, at what price they sell it, whether they change the exact, exact produce they sell this week. That's all up to them. Nobody interferes with that, but there are very strict rules as to where they can set up their, their stand, how, how the, how the, uh, emergency exits are just how they get power and water when the market opens and when it closes. And that's necessary to get the market as a whole to function. So that's, I, I like this analogy because it has this autonomous actors, the individual merchants, as well as this regulated thing. And hopefully the market doesn't regulate stuff that doesn't need to. Hopefully it focuses on the stuff that's necessary to have a functioning market that leaves the rest to the uh, ingenuity of the people who work there. There's actually a church-related principle. I love this, this thing, subsidiarity. I won't read it to you. But the idea here is that the state ought to go back and leave as much as possible to the level that actually does the work. Do you know what I mean? Like the lowest place, in the, the lowest step in the hierarchy is the best one to make it. The lowest possible place is the best one to make a decision. And that's actually church, a church rule from like hundreds of years ago, and it still matches microservices architectures, which I find kind of fascinating. Okay. Um, I'll skip over that because okay, so I'll, I'll move over to the anti-patterns because I also want to talk a bit about stuff that sometimes doesn't work out as you like it to work out. So the first one, uh, first anti-pattern that I have brought here is the, is the decoupling illusion. Now, these, of course, as you can see immediately, are microservices, right? So you've, you've decided to create a lot of simple, small things that, uh, that are all uh, uh, responsible for uh, some aspect and can scale really, really well and all run in your Kubernetes managed infrastructure, what have you. I don't, I don't care. So you've achieved your microservices goal. You can now go to a conference and talk about your microservices architecture. The problem very often is that somebody forgot these people, these stakeholder persons who sit there and have a need that spends more than one microservice. And you have many of them, right? And they have overlapping concerns. And if you look at that, you'll typically find something like this. Um, I don't know whether you can still see it. There's a little box here in the middle, which is very commonly called the order service. I'm not joking. That's you know, in e-commerce systems, that's very typically one entity service that is supposed to manage everything. And everybody depends on this particular thing. So you have those different stakeholders who have different needs and ask different things of you. Some of them might ask you to, uh, to uh, make a change this month, while the other one tells you, I don't have time to test this month, you have to postpone that. So you have these kinds of conflicts. And it's much smarter to structure things so that you have the system boundaries where the stakeholder needs are, right? So to build things according to that principle and get them to separate or figure out how to separate their needs. Sometimes I pose this question to the audience, do you know what that might be? This other thing here, the little gray box that I put there. That's your common infrastructure created by the platform team who now becomes a stakeholder that is involved in everything. Right. So you have to sometimes take a step back 
and avoid creating these kinds of things. I think I can do one more antipattern, which is this one, like what I like to call half-hearted modularization, which is that in the development phase, you have this wonderful structure, you know, this, you have separated your monolithical thing into smaller services, uh, but you have an ops team that's not on board yet. The ops team still has its processes related to bad experience uh, a decade ago or a decade ago about how to put stuff into production. So they require you to take all that and turn it into one big chunk for a deployment, which sort of defeats the service, uh, the, the, the benefits completely, right? That the purpose is completely lost because you now have this structure development, but not in, in production. So be aware of that risk as well. Oh, sorry. Okay. Skip that one and that one as well. I want to talk a bit about, uh, I don't know, I can do one more. Oh. I'll do this one. Uh, it's related to the, uh, to the one topic I had um, uh, a moment ago, which is the rule kind of thing. So I call this the uncreative chaos. I think there is something like a creative chaos. There is a certain, uh, a certain feeling that if you can play with things, if you can try out things, then uh, you get uh, new innovative ideas. And I totally agree. Um, I do believe that it's very smart to allow people to pick the best tool for the job. That's also very smart. I think it's bad to have too much structure, but I also think it's bad to have too little structure. And uh, sometimes we see those projects where um, certain things are done numerous in numerous different ways without any reason for that. Just because, just because somebody wanted to try that. The one example I had recently was there was this project that had a lot of REST APIs and people wanted to do it in a RESTful way. So they picked hypermedia formats. So they had, I believe, HAL, JSON, LD, and collection plus JSON, which are all hypermedia formats to exchange uh, hypermedia controls in RESTful interaction. Smart stuff, I love that. Um, it's a good thing. I actually did write a book about that. Um, but people had all of that, and that serves no purpose except to create confusion. You can just pick one of them. They're not that different, and it doesn't help you. It's not sometimes, diver or very often, diversity, even though ideas is a, is a great idea, is a great concept. Sometimes it's not. In this particular case, they should have just picked once. And I think this is particularly true for everything related to integration, like data formats and schemas and stuff like that, where it's a good idea to uh to limit your creativity and your your uh, uh innovation a bit okay so i'll skip that um let's skip that as well. okay i do want to spend five minutes talking about data as i'm at a data conference um, um because this is a recurring theme so um this is of course selection bias because uh, the company i'm with mostly gets hired for projects that have uh, the need for multiple teams to work on a problem, right? few small things as well, but most of the projects we do are like that. There are maybe three or five or seven teams of 10 people each working on some larger software system that's exposed to client. And uh, in that scenario, um, at least from our self-selection bias, most of them have sort of adopted that idea of autonomous teams, like a almost almost the best practice kind of thing these days. Many of them do self-contained systems, whether they call them that or not, um, and they, they get a lot of benefit from this independence and this structure. But then comes this data thing. So what many organizations have done is they've followed all of these steps. They've learned what the main driven design is. They've figured out how to structure software systems with explicit boundary modeling. Um, they uh, decentralized into autonomous teams. They broke up their monoliths or are in the process of doing that. And uh, they even have decentralized operations to a certain degree. So they have those fully autonomous, interdisciplinary, uh, cross-functional DevOps teams. So that's all kind of cool to scale up your software development. Right? But what about the data thing? And... Nicely enough, there is an approach coming up these days, which is called the data mesh approach. There'll be a, a talk this, uh, at this conference as well. I think at 1240, Chris Ford, Pablo Ford will talk about that thing later on. So do go to that talk and listen to them. 
Um, so this idea is essentially that you apply a lot of the stuff that I have talked about in the last few minutes to the data side of things as well. So all my colleagues have created a website called datamesharchitecture.com where I've shamelessly stolen those graphics from. So check that out as well. Um, so this is a super brief introduction to the data mesh topic. Again, the bigger one will be later on. The key idea here is that you do a, apply that domain ownership aspect uh, to the data part as well. So you have clear responsibilities that a team, for example, owns a particular business process and the associated data. They're responsible for, uh, for everything from, from new business ideas to implementation, to operations, debugging and, and optimization. And you add up, uh, data to that thing. You add, you add operational analytical data to that perspective as well. They're also responsible for creating data products, for creating things that actually uh, are as well maintained and structured and viewed with the same authorities as an API or a user interface would be. It's their responsibility cre to create these things. So data as a product, right? You have this, this key concept that that is a, uh, there's a, a, a tangible thing in the responsibility of one of the decentralized autonomous teams. Then you have the idea of a self-serve data platform. Again, this idea of self-service, developer self-service is applied here for the data part as well. So you need some sort of platform, which is typically one you buy or maybe integrate or customize but something that you, that you provide that you provide or that is provided by someone to everyone, to every team, so that the teams can do something and can use that thing to uh, provide their stuff. And then you have some federated governance. Federated governance is kind of a funny thing, right? You have this, there are certain things that are centralized, certain things that are not. And uh, this, this uh, takes on their responsibility for ensuring interop and, uh, and structure that is shared across things without intruding too much on individual, on individual team's responsibility. So the data mesh thing is essentially the architectural learning from all of that other stuff that I talked about applied to data merged with the knowledge from, from the data space. Um, it seems to really, really catch up. So we see there are a lot of projects, we do a lot of work with that thing. Just be aware, in my view at least, this is sort of a precondition Right? You don't start with a data mesh unless you have at least partially done that. That's kind of necessary because for the simple reason that otherwise you won't be able to convince anybody that this is useful. Right? If you start with the first one, then people will already buy that and they will ask you, how can we, how can we apply that to data? So it? I have got a great book for you to read it's called Data Mesh. And there's a lot of the stuff in the, on the web these days to get that to more detail. Okay. So I'll conclude with some recommendations so that we have a bit of time left for, for questions. So the first one is I is very, very strongly believe in autonomous teams. As with every other thing I'm saying, nothing is worth anything without context. So maybe for you, for your particular context, this is a totally stupid idea because you're building a startup with two of your friends don't separate into three teams. That's not my advice, right? So, but at a, at a certain size, with a certain type of problem, this definitely becomes the key ingredient. Is in my view the only way to scale. If, you, if I should, if I would have to, if I had to summarize it in one thing, I'd say that I strongly believe in vertical, uh, vertical uh, carving up of a domain as opposed to horizontal things because that sucks. Don't don't do that. So first thing. The second one is you need to be aware of this dependency of the relation of architecture and organization in every direction. So sometimes a particular architecture would very clearly be the best thing to do in this particular scenario, but you can't because you would have to change the architecture and that's just not an option. So if the, if the organization is fixed, that limits your architectural choices. And the reverse is true as well. If the architecture is fixed, for example, because you rely very strongly on a particular product that's already there, whether built by third party or by yourself, then that might limit what you can do in terms of organization. So for example, you might have to provide some centralized team to maintain that centralized architectural bottleneck because there is no other way and you can't just wish it away. And the third one is that I strongly believe you should create evolvable structures. 
So don't aim for the perfect architecture. Don't try to get everything right because you won't. There's just no way you will agree with yourself from two years ago, right? Whatever you thought was perfect back then, you don't like anymore today. That's just normal. We change our mind. So um, uh, take this advice, the advice from someone who has done it a lot, was tried it a lot of times. You won't get the perfect solution. It's much better to create a solution that allows you to change your mind in reasonable, to a reasonable degree later on. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.